Good morning. Thank you very much for coming. It's a pleasure to see so many people here today. Uh, this morning offers us an opportunity to, uh, and you know, excuse me, I'm going to get away from this podium. I'm not as tall as Bill Danforth. <laughs> so if you can hear me all right, great. If not, please raise your hand in the back. Uh, this may be a little easier for me. Uh, this morning offers us an opportunity to peel a layer or two back on uh, the operations of the Danforth Point Science Center. I, I think all of you here uh, understand the vitality of the mission of this place. Today we have the opportunity to hear how a fantastic staff works to carry out that very important mission. I think you will uh, uh, leave today a little bit more able to be a champion, an advocate for the center in conversations with whomever. Uh, and I'm confident that you will leave today being all the prouder of your association with this wonderful place as it works to make a difference not only for our region, but for the world. Uh, this is only the first program in what offers to be, uh, I think, a fantastic set of programs that we have throughout the year as we mark the 10th anniversary of the Danforth Plant Science Center. How about that? So without further ado, I'd like to uh, ask Bill Danforth, our chairman, to come up and uh, be our first speaker this morning. Following him will be Sam Fiorella, the COO of the center, and then finally Roger Beachy, the president of the center. So thank you very much for coming. Bill? Derek, thanks a lot, and thanks for all that you do for our center and uh, for the progress that we have. And to everybody here, welcome. I am just thrilled to see this turnout this morning. Uh, you all are very special to us. Uh, thinking about this group, you know, you've given us your faith, your energy, and your treasure. In a real sense, you are, you are our shareholders. Shareholders who have earned your equity with work and with hard-earned dollars. You're like our family to us. So this morning, Sam and Roger will report to you on where the center is today and how we have developed in the last decade. This is an ideal time to report for two reasons. First, of course, because 2008 starts our 10th anniversary year. And second, because just recently, Roger and his colleagues underwent a very tough review and very thorough review, scientific review, conducted by six of the nation's leading and most experienced scientists. So this is a special report today, and some of the news is hot off the press. Now, I'd like to set the context. Uh, I believe we're all here because of a grand dream, that through science, that is through organized human imagination and judgment, we, the inhabitants of planet Earth, can improve the lot of our fellow beings, including the lot of our own grandchildren and great-grandchildren. More specifically, we believe that this center can play a role in ending human hunger and preserving and enhancing our environment, and of course that St. Louis can be a world center and if we do it right, the World Center for Plant Science, including the commercial activities coming from that science. <clears throat> In short, we can do something wonderful for both the world and for our community. So as you listen to uh, Sam and Roger, I hope you'll keep these goals in mind asking yourselves, how are we doing in this quest to end hunger to save the environment and to build science and science-based industry here? You may say, aren't these very long-term goals? Isn't it a bit like cancer research? You can measure milestones along the way, but the problems will be with us for 20 or maybe even 50 years. How are we non-plant scientists going to understand and evaluate? Now, I'm in the same boat. I'm not a plant scientist. But then I believe that even Roger, as smart as he is, <clears throat> can see only dimly what the future holds. 
But here is the way I try to understand and evaluate. And uh, first of all, I remember why we formed the Plant Science Center. We did so because we can't reach our goals by ourselves. We decided to build an institution to do the job. And I think we, all of us, can judge the progress of our center as an institution. And that's what I'd like to suggest to you. Consider uh, these questions. First, have we the right people? Have we able scientists as judged by other scientists and by funding agencies? Have we able and well-motivated administrative staff using the right systems? Have we the volunteers who work with us, inspire us, and make us better? Do we work together as a team, or are we working on important problems? What about resources? Are they sufficient to do the jobs we've set out by our, for ourselves? Are we using the resources well? I'm a little behind on this. Work together as a team? Are we addressing the right problems? What about resources? Are they sufficient for our tasks? Are we using them well? Have we community acceptance? And are we making progress? These are the questions that we should all be asking ourselves. I hope that you will have a much clearer picture as you listen to the presentations. Then after you hear from Sam and Roger, I'm going to come back and tell you what I think. <clears throat> and uh, I am going to then take a little bit of time to speak to the questions that have an asterisk after them. Uh, about, and uh, so listen well to the next presentations. Sam? First of all, I want to thank all of you for coming this morning. It is a terrific turnout, and I'm uh, so thrilled that you all would take your time to come out here and hear us. I'm proud to be standing here before you today as a representative of the Danforth Center's administrative team, a team that I'm so proud to work with every day. And this morning, I'm going to cover three points in this presentation in my portion. First is our administrative team and its philosophy. Second is a brief overview of our financials. And third, an exciting new development and the creation of a new research park on our campus here. Our administrative team's function is twofold. One is to serve as stewards of precious resources that come to this institution, at the same time providing the highest level of service to our science and our scientists. To achieve these dual missions, we must continually analyze our operations and refine them to assure that we eliminate waste and focus our resources on activities that create an environment which is conducive to help us achieve mission impact. When I was asked to help build the Danforth Center's administrative function at, uh, more than 10 years ago, I wanted to change what I saw was an all too prevalent paradigm. Uh, this is a condition that that's, um, was uh, prevalent at some of the finest institutions in the world, uh, universities and land grant institutions and, and research institutes. And that's a situation where scientists would say, I can do good science in spite of my institution's bureaucracy. Indeed, I wanted to take that and flip it 180 degrees, turn it on its head, and turn it into a competitive advantage for the Danforth Center. And it would create a place where the scientists would eventually say, my institution's administrative support enables me to do my very best science. So what are the factors that enable us to get to the latter environment in which scientists view administrative support as a competitive advantage? First, we need to get the right people on the bus. The team that we built consists of the very brightest people with skill sets in the areas of expertise, grant accounting, and the ability to take care of a very specialized facility like this, uh, assistance in getting visas for our foreign uh, scientists and foreign workers. But that's not enough. That simply gets you through the first gate. Our team members also have to embrace the center's mission. This connection to mission helps make them better stewards and provide better service to the science. Third, we created a culture with teamwork at its very core. 
We are a small team asked to cover a wide variety of different subject areas. There's no room for silos or turf at the Danforth Center's administrative team. We've created an environment in which service to our clients, scientists, and our funders always takes front seat here. And finally, we've put together a team that embraces innovation and does not fear change. This is especially important in an industry like ours, where things change on a daily basis. In fact, we don't even have textbooks in our library. It's all online journals, because that's how rapidly things change. So if we don't continue to innovate, we'll fall behind quickly and lose our competitive advantage. So how are we doing? As good stewards and service providers, are we making the cut? Are we performing well? First, I want to reiterate that we have a small but focused and very motivated team. A team with a service mentality and a culture of working together. An important metric of our good stewardship is in the fact that over 83 cents of every dollar we spend at the center is spent directly in science, direct mission impact. This figure places a second among a peer institution. These are premier institutions that have been in existence a very long time, much longer than we have, and are significantly larger than we are, thus affording them economies of scales that we just don't benefit from. Our measurement of service to our science and our scientists is simple. We ask them. We ask them, how are we doing? How are we helping you to do your work better? And they tell us that it's among the best that they've ever experienced in their careers. Dr. Danforth asked a series of questions in his opening remarks. And he didn't uh, intend for the slide to go twice. Uh, do we have the right team? Do we work together as a team? And are we using resources well? And my answer is without hesitation, absolutely. Next series of slides are dedicated to highlighting some of our key financials. We have three critical sources of revenue at the center. The first is grant and contract awards, which cover mostly programmatic costs. These grant and contracts are important not only as a source of revenue, but because they are competitively awarded, it helps tell us that our science and our scientists are among the best in the world. Next is an annual giving line. This is a vital annual source of institutional funding for the center. And third is an endowment, and an endowment provides sources of funding to cover organizational costs for an entity like ours in perpetuity. Let's talk a little bit about each of these. First, grant and contract revenues. As you can see, grant and contract revenues have grown significantly over our first years of operations, from a figure of $2.1 million in 2000 to $10.9 million this year. This is a real tribute to Roger and his team of scientists to be able to do so well in such a competitive environment. In 1999, during the very early stages of the center's establishment, Roger and I put together a long-term budget forecast. Embedded in those forecasts were aggressive targets for grant and contract growth, stretch goals. We wondered in those early days, how would we ever hit, our, hit these lofty targets? Well, I'm proud to say, through Roger and his team's great work, that those stretch goals that we established for 2008 were $8.9 million in grants and contracts. We're coming in over $2 million over those stretch goals, something that we're all very proud of. We have also experienced remarkable growth in our annual gifts, from $400,000 in 2001 to $1.17 million last year. This impressive growth is true tribute to not only Dr. Danforth and Rogers and Laura's development team's great work, but also the terrific work of our volunteers, especially Jim Knight, who has so ably run our Friends Committee over these years. But as you can see, we have a challenge ahead of us. Jim now passes the leadership baton to Derek Rapp. As you know, and you can see from the targets for annual gifts, Derek has his work cut out for him. I've known Derek, though, for over 10 years, and I know that he will help us succeed in meeting those goals with his energy and passion and his wisdom. Our third important source of revenues will be an endowment. As I mentioned earlier, endowments are critical for the long-term success of an entity like ours because they provide a source of funding in perpetuity. We've gotten off to a good start in building our endowment. In 2005, the Danforth Foundation made a very generous gift to the center, a gift that helped us launch what we call our Campaign for a Green Future. This grant was a $50 million challenge grant that would match 
would be matched uh, other gifts on a dollar for dollar basis. Again, under Dr. Danforth and our fundraising team's great leadership, we were able to complete that challenge grant late in 2006. At the end of 2006, the Danforth Foundation made yet another challenge grant, this time for $12.5 million. We've had some early successes with that grant as well, with $7.5 million in matches raised to date. This leaves us with $5 million remaining to complete that second grant. Great progress, but more left to be done. So our grant and contracts revenues continue to grow. Our annual gifts have tripled since 2001. We are $5 million away from meeting our endowment campaign goal. Dr. Danforth asked us, are we making financial progress? And again, the answer is yes. Our mission statement to improve the human condition through plant science has three categories of how we achieve mission impact. Feed the hungry and improve human health, preserve and renew our environment, and enhance our region as a world center for plant science. And I know that Roger will cover these in more depth in his presentation, but I wanted to talk about a new initiative that will directly impact this third mission point, the enhancement of our region as a world center for plant science. Since its very early inception for the founders of the Danforth Center, they had hoped that the project, our project would help to build on the region's core life science assets. Early community leaders involved in this initiative, led by Dr. Danforth, identified the lack of available laboratory facilities as a limiting factor for this success. We have terrific incubators, the NIDA Center and the Center for Emerging Technologies in our region. Those incubators, though, are meant <clears throat> to house companies at their very infancy. What we lacked in the region were facilities that will accommodate those companies that had shown success in the early stages, had advanced their science, had, <clears throat> proof, had proof of dem demonstrated proof of concept, had raised additional monies, and had simply outgrown their incubator space, the divergences of this world. I'm pleased to announce that we have partnered with a developer which specializes in these kind of life science facilities to build such vital infrastructure on our campus. The new research park will be called the Bioresearch and Development Growth Park at the Danforth Center. When complete, this research park will consist of three laboratory buildings. We broke ground on building one only days ago, shortly after we learned that we'd been awarded a million dollars in tax credits from the state of Missouri. Building one is slated to open in the summer of 2009. We're hopeful that one day, the region's next Monsanto or Pfizer will emerge from our research park. I want to end my portion of this briefing with some thank yous. First of all, I want to thank the Danforth Center's administrative team. It's a team of talented and dedicated people, and I'm so proud to serve with them. And finally, I want to thank all of our terrific supporters, people like all of you here today. Without your generous giving of your wisdom and your work and your treasure, the center simply wouldn't be here today, so I thank all of you. Thanks, Sam. Uh, I also want to welcome each of you here this morning to uh, share uh, with, our, uh, with our leaders, uh, Bill and, and, uh, and Sam, a little bit of an update of where we are from the science program and, and let you know about what we expect in the future. You've heard about some of the successes in, that we've had financially. I want to bring up uh, some of the successes that we've had, had in, in the science side of our equation. After all, that's why we are here. And we hope that you, too, embrace the, uh, the programs and the progress that we've experienced. We always talk about our, our science mission, and, and they're important to us. I don't know how many of you carry your plastic card around, but I do because it helps to remind me of the right words because it's easy to get, to get slightly off track and I use it a lot. And this, uh, these three areas that Sam talked about, feed the hungry and improve human health and preserving and, preserving and re renewing the environment and sustaining the economic growth and development of the St. Louis region will be highlighted throughout my slides today and I hope you can see the context, uh, the context in which each of these slides are presented. Now, uh, the uh, research activities that, that we had experienced in 07 and looking forward to 08, as Sam has indicated, have been quite, uh, quite remarkable. We're very proud and pleased of what has been accomplished. 
As Dr. Danforth indicated, we did just complete a very successful review by an external committee. They've given us some guidelines of, of how we might go from where we are now to something more. But we're very pleased to know that they consider us very good. We're not starting at good to very good. We're going to go from very good to great. So it says our first 10 years has been, has been successful. Now how do we go from our very fine standing to one of the best in the world? Uh, in this last year, our, our scientific publications continue, have continued to go up. We've seen growth in peer-reviewed publications by a substantial amount. And as you might expect, this has led to more inventions and, uh, and, and patent applications, and they also continue to grow to create a greater intellectual property portfolio of science that we can then use to develop the additional growth of the economics in the St. Louis region. The, our international collaborations have grown quite substantially. I want to highlight three of them for you because they're important to us, and I'll, I'll mention at the end. For example, we, we now have a research, agree, a research and training agreement with, um, with, uh, with Wajang Agriculture University in Wuhan, China. A group of us went over last spring and met with the scientists there at Wuhan to create a, a, a partnership which brings their scientific trainees to us. We recently established a, uh, an, an uh, uh, important relationship with a new institution in New Delhi. They're about the same age as we. They have very much the same mission as we, that is basic science for applications. They're looking for ways to use their scientific background to enrich the food production and environmental protection in India, and they see that we can partner well together. And the third is a, a relationship with the Weizmann Institute in, um, in Jerusalem, in a, in a scientific partnership in training. Now, the, there are a number of scientific uh, reasons why we've had these relationships established, but there's, an, uh, there's a financial reason as well. Each of these partnerships are funded by external partners. In other words, they bring uh, scientists to us at their expense, which gives us a, an enhanced workforce and allows our dollars that we bring in grants and contracts to be extended further. By, by having their uh, involvement with us at their, at their um, at expense. The establish, uh, establishment of these collaborations also includes uh, local collaborations that have been successful in this year in the, in the St. Louis region. The uh, relationship with Washington University and their iCARES Institute, uh, recently announced and directed by Dr. Himadri Prakrase, has, uh, has received a boost in funding through resources from the State of Missouri Life Science Research Fund. And, and that fund allows us to uh, uh, embark on a research program that includes Washington University, the University of Missouri St. Louis, University of Missouri Columbia, and Danforth Center, and St. Louis University. Again, partnering to make the most of our region's uh, assets. There's a, a second uh, partnership that's established between the Danforth Center and Metabolics Incorporated in Boston, Massachusetts. Again. Uh, sponsored through the Life Science Research Fund, uh, funded by the state of Missouri. That has the added benefit that in this year, Metabolics will, will establish a team here in St. Louis, be part of the incubator system, and finally into the outgrowth building, uh, the new building that Sam just described to you. They'll be establishing a research team here in St. Louis. In fact, I believe they've already uh, signed their first lease. And they will be drawing on the workforce from the Danforth Center and local communities. In fact, I think they'll hire some of our bright postdocs, and we hope they don't take them too many away. But, but in, in fact, uh, it's, it's a good outlet for our scientists to find additional employment beyond the postdoctoral positions here at, at the Danforth Center. Bring you up to date on where the Enterprise Rent-A-Car Institute uh, is, how it's doing. You, you all recall the um, outstanding gift that the Taylor family made to the Danforth Center to create the Enterprise Rent-A-Car Institute with a, a wonderful gift of $25 million. Uh, the, the, the Institute is, is not going to uh, specifically focus on a program because we believe that, that uh, bio, the biofuels future relies on constancy of, of production of material the, the feedstocks or the materials that go into making more biofuels and the consistency of quality of those materials. In other words, uh, if, if we're making new oils that would make new biodiesel, we want that to be the very highest quality of oil that would go into biodiesel. We also recognize that if we're making uh, cellulosic ethanol from trees, that the composition of the walls of trees are chemically different 
than the composition of Stover from a corn stalk. So how do you make the complexity of the chemistry of the wall fit into this model of making new cellulosic ethanol? That'll be part of the challenge that, that we see as important. We also realize that in order to produce this fuel at low cost, we must be as highly efficient in our agriculture as possible. We need to have this bioenergy produced with low inputs of water and fertilizer. And that's part of the sustainability issue in the, of the environment as well. We want to be able to grow a lot of material on less land with less inputs. So we have to study things. We have to have a solution for uh, the challenges of drought tolerance and increasing yields and better and, more, and better and more material. But we also want to build on the strengths of the Danforth Center. In, in other words, we're not turning this into an institute of renewable fuels. We're going to build on the strengths and capture the imagination and creativity of our existing scientists, as well as hiring a few other scientists to enhance the, the, uh, what we're doing now and, and move scientists in directions that will augment the mission of the Enterprise Rent-A-Car Institute. Uh, the search for the director is still underway. We're getting closer, and we, uh, we hope that in 2008 we'll be able to, in the early part of 2008, we'll be able to announce to you uh, the, uh, the addition of the director of the Enterprise Rent-A-Car Institute. The international programs continue to be an important component of the, uh, of the Danforth Center's activity, and, and I wanna just want to highlight the progress in a couple of, of programs. There is a, a project that is uh, done by Tom and Dillip in their laboratories to, to address an issue that is important in Africa. There is a, um, you recognize this as of corn, of course, but you see the gray mold that's on, on the edge. This is caused by an infection by a fungus called Fusarium. <clears throat> what makes that, uh, so the disease is bad enough, but uh, in, in fact, it's got a, a downside in that that fungus produces a, a small molecule with a chemical structure that looks like this one. But the impact is that it can cause human cancers as well as reduce, reduce the nutrition in people that eat corn that has had a fungal infection. This is especially bad in parts of Africa uh, where, where corn storage is not as, as high tech as it is in the Midwest. And when they get moldy corn, these, uh, this can lead to disease and, and death amongst those who would eat corn. So this is an important, com uh, important project for us. We continue to make progress in a project now that's nearly 20 years old. We've developed the technology and new varieties of rice uh, that, if successful, will be useful in Southeast Asia and India to develop virus resistant uh, through virus resistance, which will improve the yields of that uh, of, of rice. The Rockefeller Foundation once called that disease the uh, number one challenge for science and technology in Asia. And lastly, thirdly, the uh, project in cassava continues to make very good progress. I'm very pleased that, that the uh, challenges that we had several years ago at least look, look like we've overcome some of those challenges. We have new varieties of virus-resistant cassava that you see on the lower left-hand side. And the new initiative that started several years ago with the Gates Foundation was to increase the, was to in, make not only more cassava, but cassava that's more healthy to eat. And what you see in the, in the lower right are three test tubes, and you see that the tube on the, on the left-hand side of that picture is, uh, contains white powder. That white powder is actually ground up cassava, it's cassava flour. And what you see in, in the yellow and orange is, is are the results of work in, in Ed's lab. Uh, to develop cassava that is more yellow. Well, this is rich in beta carotene. Beta carotene is a precursor, of course, of vitamin A. And so we have far exceeded the expectations of the, of the Gates Foundation who gave the grant for this research. This cassava has 15-fold more vitamin A than, this, than the cassava that you see on the left-hand side, the white cassava. So we're very pleased with that success. So what are the goals that we have for the program in, in 2008? This research has now progressed quite well, and we're ready for advanced testing, and applications are being made for greenhouse trials for the rice in the Philippines. We've had our first trial there successfully, and we're looking for expanding that, those, those trials. Uh, we have made application for a maize field trial in North Carolina that, that will allow these, this uh, improved maize that we talked about earlier to have be field trialed in, in North Carolina. By the way, that project will also be useful for American farmers if it's, if it's successful, because American farmers still struggle with this, with this disease as well. 
And uh, the, we're making very good progress in uh, getting our field trial applications completed for Uganda, Kenya, and Puerto Rico. We'll be taking material to Puerto Rico as a first stopover uh, and on fe February 11th, I believe is the date, and the applications in Uganda are going along well. The political situation in Kenya leaves us a little bit uneasy. We're un unsure how that will work, how that will uh, uh, play out. The, uh, the commitment to Africa is, is relatively large, and it's an important one for us. And as, the, as these grants that we've received in the last several years have come, uh, we've increased our collaborations through training and collaborations that lead to new facilities. And uh, we've, we, have both we have trainees here from, from a number of countries, but we're also helping the, our collaborators in Uganda to build new uh, facilities, laboratories, and greenhouses that will allow them to expand their involvement in our project. After all, when we're finished with improving cassava or sweet potato or maize, our goal is to hand off that technology and the knowledge so that continue, yeah, can continue in their countries. It will require resources for them and, and, and new facilities as well. We are very pleased with the, with the growth uh, in the last six or seven or eight years in our education programs in the St. Louis area. And this helps to enhance the region through training additional students and, uh, and postdoctoral scientists. We're, we're pleased that the National Science Foundation sponsored undergraduate program that you're, you've been made aware of in the past. There's a, a program that uh, Terry Woodford has put together on, uh, on the Amer uh, from the American Society of Plant Biology and sponsoring some computer modeling. We're very pleased also of, uh, that the Boeing Company has joined with us in developing what are called technology trunks. Uh, these trunks contain uh, materials and supplies that we uh, can be, that, that uh, Terry and her colleagues put together to take out the high schools around the St. Louis region to uh, engage these, these students, these high school students, in, uh, more, in a more involved way in, in technology, similar to technology that we have here. We're hopeful that there will be additional technology trunks. The first one is on DNA. We hope the next one will be on protein. And we hope the next one is on high throughput screening of, of DNA samples. Chris Taylor and his colleagues are working on that one. And all together, we think we've had a, a good year. We have a, a long way to go to reach all of the goals that we've had uh, set for ourselves five years ago. Uh, we could not have achieved these goals without the involvement of outstanding administrative staff, such as the one that uh, Sam talked about. We couldn't have it without a, a programmatic, uh, strong development program. And we certainly couldn't have had it without you. Thank you all very much for being part of the Danforth Center. I'll turn the uh, podium back over to Dr. Danforth. Thank you. I hope you have answers to all the questions. But if not, there'll be, we'll have a question and answer period uh, as soon as I finish. Uh, first, though, I'm going to give you my take on what we've just heard. I'm thrilled. Perhaps I should have been more optimistic. But in fact, we are way ahead of where I expected to be at the end of our first decade. To back up that statement, let me give you a few quotes that I wrote down from the Scientific Review Committee as they talked to us. Impressive. Excellent place to work. Supportive atmosphere. Roger Beachy manages well. He provides leadership at all levels. Scientists all agree that staff is giving excellent service. Excellent bunch of scientists. First 10 years are an immense success. Now, they did not say we we're perfect. They made a number of great suggestions about processes. They advised us that it's time for a new strategic plan to build on the early successes. Now, I could stop there, but I want to add a few more personal comments. We're, <clears throat> we're further along financially than I expected to be. My goal, and one that I hope you all share, is to make the center strong enough financially that we can be sure that it will continue indefinitely. Uh, that's been the goal of this campaign from the start. To continue indefinitely for the benefit of humanity and for the benefit of our community. As Sam told you, we're already on the verge of reaching that financial sustainability. 
We're not there yet, but we will if we can continue to grow our annual giving program to reach the 1.4 million mark by 2010 and to raise $5 million to reach the endowment that we need of $150 million. I won't say that these goals are easy. They're not. They require dedication and hard work and, of course, generosity. But the goals are within reach, something I could not have said three years ago. If we can accomplish these goals, we can be sure to leave something behind for our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren. I'm grateful, I am excited, and I promise to work for these goals. But the money is only support for the real goals, only an enabler. Great people have to use it effectively in pursuit of our dreams. Fortunately, as we have heard, we have great people, people who believe in the mission, people who are working hard and creatively. We all know from the evidence that Roger Beachy is an outstanding scientist. In the last decade, he has proved himself a talented recruiter of scientists and scientific leaders. He has built this plant science center. He set the direction, recruited the staff, so that today we have the testimony of world-class scientific evaluators that our scientists and scientific leaders are first-rate and working on important problems. Moreover, we have in place scientific quality controls, such as this visiting team, and the best method of scientific of that, this is the best method of scientific evaluation known to man or to woman. The promise of the science is why we're here, and I'm thrilled that our confidence has been well validated. But that's not all. The scientists are supported by a marvelous administrative staff of dedicated people who are working hard and together. Morale is high. Our community has accepted us, or we would not have the resources we have. Rob Rose and Ellen Landers tell our stories well, and I would add that thanks to Roger, our home, while our home community is St. Louis, we also are part of a international community as well. And we're building the future economy and as well as, so how lucky we are, <coughs> how lucky we are to do good for our friends and simultaneous, and around the world and simultaneously for our friends at home. We are not where we want to be, but, or will be, or we're not where we want to be, or where we will be a decade from now. But I am ahead, but we're way ahead of where I expected to be in January 2008. Finally, we have the world's greatest volunteers, all friends of ours. Some serve on our board and on board committees. Our PR committee has imaginative, experienced volunteers, including our own Robin Frankel. Especially, we are blessed with an able, hardworking friends committee, a group whose enthusiasm never seems to lag, a group that has played and is playing a key role in our success. The friends have had wonderful leadership, first with Bob Virgil, then with our beloved Jim Knight, and now with the very able Derek Rapp, all of whom we have admired and all of whom have made our work fun. The same is true of our amazing development staff, Laura C., Laura K., Sarah Nell, and Chandra. The friends are very busy. You are ambassadors to the community. A committee chaired by Robin Frankel oversees the Our Conversation series. A committee chaired by Adi Dietz heads the, do eats the docent program that conducts tours for visitors. You've been involved in planning special events and our hardworking group, that is you, have worked phonathons, have brought us new volunteers and new donors and more dollars by encouraging larger gifts. Sam has shown the results of your work, the growth of annual support, 
already last year, to, it would be equal to the income on an endowment of 20 million. We could not be where we are without you. You're our friends. You make this life, you, <coughs> you make this life fun. You inspire us to work harder. You give us confidence that we will succeed. I thank you. We all thank you. So on to the next challenge. You know, I, uh, we know how, uh, what the difficulties are in, in Kenya. Um, we have had contacts with our partners there. It's, uh, it's clear that we will be delayed and that the process will be slowed by, by the disruptions. Indeed, the field trials uh, site that we had anticipated was in western Kenya, where the toughest of, of the retributions have been. So it, it's, it's quite likely we'll, we'll, we'll be delayed in Kenya. We don't know for sure. I don't know if, if uh, Claude is here or anybody from the international office to validate how far back we are, but it's a significant uh, impact, I think. Is your work with RICE integrated with Monsanto? The uh, work with RICE is not. Indeed, the work with RICE is, is going to be put into the public domain. RICE, uh, rice seed uh, sales are, are, are low. It's since it beca because it's an important um, sustaining crop, the uh, countries that grow a lot of rice have their internal national seed companies. Most of those national seed companies exist to give seed away to farmers. And it's, dif it's been difficult for the private sector to break into a market like that one. In fact, one would wonder if, if we could only improve the public system, would this not be better for the poor farmer who relies on rice? There are some commercial rice ventures in Asia, but they're a small percentage of the total. We've decided in this case to release the technology that we're taught that it will be tested uh, to the public domain. We have not filed applications on it. We want to make it readily available in India and in China, uh, India and in, in Southeast Asia. This is one of those examples where we've made a strategic decision not to try to go commercial, but to do this in the public domain. Yes, please. <laughs> yeah. I read an article recently about uh, the use, uh, experiments being done with optical maze in developing higher sugar content uh, products for ethanol use, which was around here. Do, do you agree with that? Uh, it, in general, I've, I know about it through South Africa and what's going on in South Africa. I don't know if that will also be used in Mexico or other parts of Mesoamerica where, where, right, where maize might be grown. But we do know that in South Africa, where maize, maize uh, production has risen quite dramatically in South Africa the last three or four years because they're using some of the, the new varieties from Monsanto, the insect resistance and, the, and, uh, and, and drought tolerance and so forth that have been played out through the new varieties. That's led to an overabundance of uh, a higher production in, in Africa than ever before. Some of that is going into uh, bioethanol production as, a, as it is here. A smaller percentage, but the excess. And they're now breeding for those tropical maize for higher levels of, uh, of, of sugar and starch content to increase the yield. Now, I think how this whole, play, this whole thing plays out in the world scene is, is going to be very interesting. While the food prices have risen as a consequence of the use of soybeans and corn for biofuels, what we're finding is that it's also encouraging farmers in Africa and Asia to become more entrepreneurial and engaged in higher productivity agriculture and pushing for better corn, better wheat, uh, and even better cassava for biofuels. So it, it's an interesting time. It, it's not a, a pleasant time in the next five or 10 years as we get through this battle of food versus fuel. You know, How much should go where? Who's going to decide? What crops should be grown? How much algae should there be versus corn? Uh, and so forth. So I, I think we have, we're in a transition time, but I think it will lead to better op to increased opportunities. Problem is we don't want those challenges to affect those who live on a dollar or two dollars a day, and so adversely that they can't make it through.
That's, that's the political as well as, as economic reality. Uh, that's, that's a great question. That really is a good question and one that we consider all the time. We think that we are positioned well uh, to be responsive to the, uh, to the wishes of foundations such as the Gates Foundation and others. So we've positioned ourselves well there. We believe that the, we, we are quite, uh, uh, it's quite likely that Gates Foundation will increase their involvement in agriculture. But interestingly, they will not only be agriculture for Africa or India, they're going to be looking at even fundamental basic questions in plant science that will make success of their African missions more likely. In other words, that drought tolerance and disease resistance will be part of their plan as well. So I think we're well positioned with the foundations. The issue with the federal grants is, is recognized as very difficult. On average, the grants, uh, the, the, there's one out of 11 grants submitted to the National Science Foundation is actually awarded. That means for every 10 our institute puts in, we hope that one or two are successful. That's a dismal, uh, that's a dismal outlook. But our scientists are applying to the National Institutes of Health, the National Science Foundation, the USDA, the EPA, the Department of, of Energy, and, and hopefully the Department of Defense sometime. And, and we are playing, uh, we're using all of those sources as we can, but it's not going to get better. It's, we imagine it will get more stressful before it gets easy. But I think we're well positioned. In terms of the private sector, we do find the private sector is, is in, interested more it has increased interest in funding science in institutions like ours because they can't do all their own basic research inside and, and we're looking increasingly outside and, and we're looking and we are um, receiving a, a number of calls and are responding to those. So I think we'll see those grants and contracts on the private side go up. Government grants and contracts will probably drop a bit. We'll maintain our foundation support. Uh, I, I think that looks good for the next five years. Dr. Danford. I just wanted to add one thing. I come from a medical background, and I think medical research should be better funded. But the United States government spends $14 on medical research for every dollar spent on agricultural research. And the priorities are just way out of balance. That's one of the reasons this institution is so important, because we have not been pursuing agricultural research the way we should. Uh, when you look at the kind of grants that support a place like this, the National Institutes of Health spends $150 for every dollar spent by the Department of Agriculture. Uh, Kit Bond, our senator, has been very helpful in trying to change that. But I think it's very important for all of us to uh, think this is something our nation should do. It should change its priorities and raise these, answering these kind of questions to a much higher level. Well, the, the challenge always, uh, as, as many of, our, as, of you are aware, that the search for new bioactive materials that would be useful in, in health-related uh, activities has often has been plant-based for many years. In fact, more than half of the drugs on the market either have come from plants or information that started with plants before they went into clinical trials and finally into capsules. And we are very pleased with the relationship that we have between the Danforth Center and the Botanical Garden, but increasingly our scientists are involved in collaborations with the medical school. Uh, Meinhard Zank and Tony Kuchan. Tony uh, and, uh, arrived here last year. They have a strong relationship and building relationships with the garden to, to identify new bioactive materials is ongoing. Uh, it's slow right now bec uh, because at the end, the challenges are how do you do the, the creative, innovative work as preliminary data to now to, to get the grants that you need for the long-term part uh, of, 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 a research, of research support. And they're doing an outstanding job, and as are others here at the, at the center, in trying to find ways to impact human health. The vitamins and minerals and protein enrichment in foods is, an, is, is the first step of this. 
Uh, Tony and her colleagues and Oliver, you and others are looking for ways to extend this into other areas of, of uh, pharmacologically active materials that might either be delivered through food or through isolated materials. It's a start, but uh, it's something that I hope will grow. It's part of the partnership between us and the community. And the relationship with the medical school is outstanding and with the botanical garden equally as good. The foundation is good. It's not as rich as it will be in the future, I, I, I think, if, if the success, some successes are, are achieved. Yes. Hi, Jim. Question, Uh, those are very, very good questions. The first answer is yes, there's an investment committee, and it's another um, competitive advantage we have at the Danforth Center. Although we're small, we have access to some of the best minds and the most dedicated people I've ever met, folks who are both members of our board of trustees, but also who are not, and they just serve on our committee because they have such terrific um, expertise in this area. So we have a great committee. We've recently put together an investment policy statement. We this year conducted a search, a national search for an investment management firm. Uh, that search was led by John McDonald, who is uh, the chair of that investment committee. And with John's leadership, we selected a local firm called Hammett Associates, which um, I have really just been um, so impressed with their talent and their ability to access investments around the world. Um, as you know, uh, endowment is, a, is an investment in perpetuity. So we look at the long, long term. We mix our assets from alternative investments in real estate and stocks and bonds. Um, but when we forecast those returns, it's long term. We've only just started with them. We started this year. Um, the money started coming in from the first gifts, so it's very new. Our return to date have been um, good, uh, benchmarking with some of the um, uh, indices, both uh, national and international. Um, but I'm very confident, again, with this leadership of this terrific investment committee that uh, our investments will be managed, it'll be second to none with their uh, not only helping to establish it, but their constant monitoring of our investments. Richard, Richard Brady is up to date about Europe and genetically modified food. The, uh, the discussion with regard to uh, um, genetic use of and, and um, purchase and, and even import of genetically modified foods continues. The import is not, uh, it's been quite well taken care of. There's a lot of corn and soybeans grown in the U.S. that go into, into the, uh, Europe. There are uh, glitches along the way. We heard President Sark uh, Sarkozy indicate that it's not going to be any, there won't be any field trials uh, or field growing this year. The last, as of last week, it looks like they will make a decision and they likely will make a decision early enough to plant GM corn in, in France this year. Uh, there's a lot of politics at play in every country. The, the part that is helping, I think, is a in worldwide demand for, uh, for food. I mean, there's a wheat shortage this year because of droughts in Australia. There is a, there's a, a barley shortage. There's a hops shortage. Uh, there are shortages all around. And increasingly, farmers in Europe are asking their governments to reconsider their bans. The German scientists want access to more GM seeds. The French scientists, I mean French farmers, the, the Spanish farmers, the Portuguese farmers. Uh, if, as we move slowly through this, I think the increased demand will require increased efficiency and that's going to come through new genetics. So it, it's moving slowly, but we're, we are uh, a little more optimistic this year than, the, than we were last. Derek. Right. The, the, original, uh, found, the original founding institutions were, of course, the uh, Missouri Botanical Garden, Washington University, uh, here in St. Louis. Uh, Monsanto had their input, but never were, they were a part of the founding discussions, but aren't part of what considered part of the, uh, the um, partnership in the academic institutions, of course. And, of course, the University of Missouri. Uh, that has been absolutely uh, um, the strongest link for us, have, have been in Missouri. The other, I see I said it, Missouri. <laughs> the, uh, the strongest, uh, those are the strongest partnerships. The re relationships with Illinois and Purdue, which were part of the founding uh, 
uh, partnership or alliance has been less strong. We have currently have grants, uh, COA grants or um, multi-institutional grants that include Illinois and Purdue, but they are more distant. They are they're tougher to maintain. And the, the honest, honest part is it, it, proximity makes a big difference. So our partnerships have grown, inclu increasing partnerships with the University of Missouri St. Louis because they have grown their plant science group. And that has brought new opportunities um, in, in biology, and they're also interested in the biofuels arena and nanotechnology, including in uh, might impact uh, food and agriculture. So I think what, what we imagine as a start off, that is, this would be a catalyzing activity. The Danforth Center would catalyze other institutions to raise their involvement in plant science has worked. Partnerships have been developed. Some are more strong than others. And we are doing the part to in increase the, uh, the workforce in the St. Louis region, as I said, by metabolics and others hiring our folks away. We, we always uh, look in, and uh, we, we're proud of people when they go off to new jobs, but that means we have to replace them. And, uh, and, and that, that's, that, that's a, a good challenge, but uh, that, that's been part of, part of the reality. Good question. Thanks, Derek. Derek, do you want to, uh, one more question? Yes, please. I just wanted to make a statement that I think this is one of the best orient, uh, orientations that I've attended. And I want to say to you all, of course, it's wonderful explanation of what's going on. And uh, hopefully this will encourage each of us to go and get another new friend. <laughs> Uh, again, thank you all very, very much for spending uh, the last hour or so with us. Uh, I also want to thank those who encouraged us to make our message more clear, because it has been useful, and I'm glad to have some of the audience mention it. Uh, it it's, we all learn, and uh, we, we want to be able to communicate as effectively as possible. Derek? Thanks, Roger. Uh, I think we all owe a, a thank you and a congratulations to the staff for a great 2007 and a great last 10 years. So uh, to those of you who are uh, involved some way as a volunteer, a donor, whatever, you were thanked today by each of these three gentlemen, but I think you were also challenged, uh, and I think George summed it up very well there. Uh, we have work to do, and that is to continue to help make this place sustainable so it can carry out its very important mission uh, as far as we can ever see it and then beyond. So uh, let's go do that, and thank you very much for your time today. And